Welcome to Motivated to Lead Podcast, helping you become a better leader. I'm your host, Mark Coinsign. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us again for our podcast this week. Each week, we talk with a leader in the corporate world as well as in the nonprofit world. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking with Brian Barrier. Brian is an experienced executive, has uh, experience in large companies such as Medtronic, is a president of the Peripheral Vascular Division, uh, has worked at Covidian, and uh, he has moved into the startup world uh, as the CEO of Osseo. And he's going to share some thoughts about the experience from moving from a large company to a startup organization and some other great insights that he's going to share with us today. Looking forward to our conversation with Brian. Brian, can you give us just a little bit of your your background or your career? And love to hear your story. Sure, Mark. And uh, thank you for uh, for having me this morning. Uh, I've been, uh, my background is, 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 is pretty straightforward. I started in medical technology sales back in 1990. And uh, I was a sales rep in the early part of my career for a a homegrown or family-owned startup company here in Boston, very small company, Mm -hmm. where we sold uh, mostly high fluid delivery, um, access technology, central venous catheters, things like that. And And I bounced in my career for over that, you know, maybe the next four years, uh, seeking exactly what I wanted to do, and ultimately I landed at Medtronic in in uh, 1996 as a uh, Medtronic interventional vascular sales rep. So I was selling the angioplasty products. Mm-hmm. It was right at the time when uh, when coronary bare stent technology was emerging in the U.S. market as the standard of care, and um, uh, I was I, and I and I stayed with Medtronic for the better half of the next 14 years. Uh, elevating uh, throughout that period of time in responsibility from a sales rep to a sales manager in 2000. Uh, I went to Santa Rosa where I was part of the uh, uh, sale, uh, the marketing team out there, did marketing and education for a couple of years. In 2005, I came back to the uh, East Coast to be the East Coast sales director for the coronary uh, group for Medtronic. And, I, and about six months later, I became the head of U.S. sales. And I was the head of U.S. sales from uh, mid-2005 uh, until the latter part of 2010. And uh, then at that period, I was looking for what was next in my career, very interested to move into a uh, more of a broader operational role, of which I was able to do by moving to Covidian in that March 2010. Um, and uh, with Covidian, I had a terrific uh, opportunity to not only do what I, what I wanted to do in broadening my career, uh, gain more operational experience outside of the traditional sales and marketing that I had in, in prior years, uh, uh, and of course, through multiple acquisitions and uh, improving the capability that we had internally to develop our products at Covidian through those acquisitions, we were able to uh, take that business from what was at the time that I joined about 350 million to about a billion two, mm-hmm. specifically in the area of peripheral vascular. Uh, in, uh, of course, in Ju- uh, January 2015, Medtronic acquired us back. I like to say acquired me back, but uh, the truth <laughs> is they saw a huge opportunity in uh, combining uh, the capabilities and the portfolio of Covidian with theirs. Uh, to increase uh, their access to the major service lines within hospitals. And uh, I, I think the, the history there is it's been, it's been pretty successful. Uh, I stayed on for about a year and a half to lead the integration of the peripheral vascular business into the aortic and vascular business within Medtronic. And then in June of 2016, moved on. And from that point, I was just doing board work and consulting uh, and was introduced to Osseo uh, that spring 2016. Great. Yeah, I always tell people that you, you always uh, don't burn bridges because in, in industry, you sometimes end up working for the company that you left. And, and so yeah. that, uh, yeah. yeah. This, well, the, the, the second tours of duty, if you will, are always, uh, 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 you know, interesting in a way that you know the company you're going back to. So it's easier from that perspective. Right. Um, but you've also gained some valuable experience outside the company 
uh, and it and it teaches you things that really uh, are important to you. Uh, so uh, it's easy on one hand, but on the other hand, as you know, it's not surprising that a year and a half went by and I was looking to do something else. Sure. Well, tell me a little bit about the transition. We've talked a little bit about it uh, when we've, we've talked uh, in the past about kind of the transition from a, a large global uh, company to a, more of a startup entrepreneurial uh, type role. Tell us a little bit about that transition. We, you know, we have a number of people that listen to this that are kind of up and coming leaders or new leaders. Uh, but uh, tell a little bit about the differences and also some of the things that you've learned since you've uh, gone sure. into more of a startup. It's probably the most uh, common question that I feel, frankly, is uh, after spending so many years, greater than two decades, uh, in big companies, uh, so to speak, to to now move over to something that's considered more of an early stage or startup is the typical word that people use to describe uh, what we do. Um, it, it There are certainly differences. Uh, things that um, I think there's some mis, misnomers, frankly, uh, things that, you know, are perceived that aren't reality, and then there's reality. And uh, so some of the things that I had heard prior to doing it uh, were – that when you're in a big company, you have all the resources in the world uh, to at your disposable uh, disposal to go ahead and you know execute whatever it is that you're doing and to be successful. And you know it was all about the resources and that you didn't you know because of resources or people, it made your life easier or made your job easier. Uh, and then when you get to startup, of course, you're you're resource constrained and it's more difficult. Well, I I, I like to tell people and certainly remind every others that that we've worked with over the years that large companies the same as small companies it's just a matter of what size the budget is so you're, you're never not constrained you're always having to make difficult decisions about what it is that you're going going to do that will drive the greatest amount of value uh, there's not an, unle- an ending supply of money in big companies um, and certainly there's not that in small companies and uh, so that's just to clear that up, that no matter where you are, you, you're, you're going to be held accountable uh, to constraints. And because of that, held accountable as a leader or in any role to make very difficult decisions about what it is you're going to do. And then importantly, sometimes what it is that, what it is that you're not going to do, you know, the discipline to stay with the things that, uh, that we believe will drive the greatest amount of value for our stakeholders. Um, some of the things that are true is, are that when you are in the startup world, um, no matter what role you have, you will have a dozen other roles. So if you're the CEO of the company, uh, I'm sitting here in our Boston office, you know, I on some days on a Saturday morning, I'm, I'm the one that's cleaning the conference room or, you know, uh, uh, you know, in our in our regulatory efforts, although we have a head of regulatory and we work with tremendous regulatory consultants, I have to roll up my sleeves and dive into the detail of our regulatory efforts um, more so than maybe you do uh, when you're with a larger company. You tend to you tend to handle things uh, at maybe a higher level, maybe more the strategic level versus the tactical level in in, in some cases. So. Yeah, I think the transition uh, for me personally has been a terrific experience. Um, I, I think I led in my past on vision and, uh, you know, authenticity in, in some cases. Um, and here now I'm doing both of those, but, uh, but much deeper into the detail across every element of the business, which has given me a great opportunity to learn. Although I understood areas of operations, manufacturing, supply chain, regulatory, or clinical, um, in my past, I'm now very much into the detail across everything that we're doing here. So to stay focused, and, and I think it's, you know, again, the, the importance of, of taking on the right things versus doing just a, a lot of things that aren't going to move the, uh, uh, move the ball. Uh, what, what are some things that you do just to keep the focus uh, in, your, in your company and you personally as far as, as, a, as an executive? Sure. Uh, it's, it's, I, I think it's the, the number one thing that any executive uh, you know, should be considering for their organization is how do you drive um, alignment uh, down through the organization and across multiple stakeholders, internally or external stakeholders, uh, to ensure that you can manage 
uh, those things that are going to drive the greatest amount of value. So it's not tremendously complex. There's, I don't think there's a, a, a secret, uh, you know, software you can use. It really just does um, happen as a result of many years, in some cases of failing more than succeeding and just learning the things that work and the things that do not work. Um, what I have found that works is uh, number one is going to be about your team, having the best people you can find uh, with you in your journey. Um, and uh, because at the end of the day, I always uh, like to keep things simple. You know, there's a difference between, uh, you know, simply playing the game and winning the game and, and winning the game will always come down to people. And so it does happen that in order to maintain discipline and continue to stay focused on the key value drivers, uh, you have to have the organization around you. You have to have the governance, uh, not overly uh, process oriented, but there has to be some governance in a way that we can work together. We do work together to understand what are the goals and objectives of the company that are going to drive the greatest amount of value for our internal and external stakeholders, our employees, our customers, our shareholders, and, um, and make sure that that is communicated down to the organization so that even in the deep parts of the organization, individual objectives are straightly aligned to the high level goals of the company. So I, I, again, I don't see this as being magical in any way, um, but it does start with people. And then I think there's a, a moderate amount of, um, of, uh, you know, governance and process that enables you to do that. And then, and then there's the fortitude, you know, it's very easy to change course. Um, you know, in some cases too early, in some cases too late. And so, uh, you know, I think that does come with experience to figure out, you know, when is it time to uh, maybe cut bait, so to speak, on certain mm -hmm. things that you're doing and move to something else. And then there are other times that you have to, you know, stay with it um, because you believe so much in it. Um, but there is a, uh, there's a, there's a fine line there. Around people, uh, you've put together a team uh, there at your current company, and you've put together teams in, in your past when you were with Medtronic and with Covidian. Tell a little bit about kind of your philosophy about uh, putting the right team in place, and what are some of the things, qualities that you look for? Yeah, sure. I, so, so the first thing I would start with always is myself. It, you, you know, it, it, and this comes, I think, with years of, um, you know, internal self-reflection and you know building a self-awareness that uh, in in early parts of a career I think it, it's not surprising that people that are very confident believe they can do everything mm -hmm. um, you know that that it, and I think that as as you gain more experience you come to understand you know where are your own personal strengths and and then how do you complement um, that and so it starts with the gaps you know what is needed in the organization from an experience standpoint. Uh, I, I think that's the more easy part. The more difficult part is the, um, the personality of the people you look for. I'm a big believer in culture. So personally, and I've, I've probably interviewed in my career thousands of people, and uh, I'm not a big believer in walking step-by-step step through a resume per se. Um, I think that there are neat tricks uh, you know, and, and we've all been trained on them, whether it's the star model or any of these other models that enable you to navigate through someone's career. And, you know, for lack of a better word, you know, it's about catching somebody, you know, through details of examples of whether or not they truly, have. but, but I really do spend a lot of time on the person. Um, who are they? What motivates them? Uh, ensure that they also come with a strong sense of self-awareness, understand their strengths, their weaknesses, uh, where they can add value understand what cultures they like to work in, the people they like to work with, the type of team player they are. This is about a team. There's no one individual that can, that can make a company successful, including the CEO of a company. Uh, so I think those are, you know, I'm, I'm much more focused on the person at this point in my career than I am about the details, so to speak, in a resume, although that is important. Clearly, experience is going to be important. Sure. One of the questions I ask uh, every CEO that's that's on the uh, podcast is, uh, if you could go back uh, and talk to a 22-year-old uh, Brian, what what advice would you give him, knowing what you know now? Uh, it's 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 an interesting time. 
uh, obviously I have kids now that, 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 uh, you know, were me when they were starting out. So, you know, I practice on them, so to speak, but, uh, but you know, the world changes and, um, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, you know, I can, I could, I guess I could say that, you know, uh, you have to be willing to maybe do things early in your career for a period of time that, uh, that aren't necessarily so exciting to you. Um, if you have ambitions, so to, to be a, a general manager, um, I think today, given, given how technology works and how fast information flies, um, the ambition, uh, you know, is, is, uh, is extremely high and therefore, you know, is, is, a, is, is a younger um, person who's entering into the beginnings of their career going to be patient enough to develop their profession and their person um, uh, to, to when they do get to that point as a general manager, they will be successful. I, I, I and, and I, you know, as I said, I talked to my, my own kids about this. It's, it's really about putting yourself in a good place, putting yourself in a good company around good people that you're going to be willing to just listen and learn from. I think that's the key. The key is not assume that you know so much or you can do so much. Uh, build your brand, learn, listen, uh, and, 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 and you will look back. I, I'm sure of it. You'll look back and you'll, you'll think that's the right model. I think jumping too quick into jobs when you're not ready and I've had them um, become difficult. Uh, and uh, so, you know, that would be my advice is to surround yourself with good people first and foremost in good companies. Don't, don't focus so much on the, the, the job per se, or the amount of money you're making, because that there's plenty of time in a career for that to happen. If you skip the step and the opportunity to learn and listen from the best people you can find, it, it'll, it'll have an impact later in life. Right. So were you intentional about uh, getting mentors in your, your career? Uh, tell us a little bit about that and kind of who are some of your mentors. Again, I, I, I don't think I'm any different than anybody else who's beginning their career. I think in the beginning, you have such confidence in your own abilities that sometimes you overlook er, at early parts in your career the value of a mentor. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't say in the beginning I was intentional. I, I think that was learned. I think, I think as you, you grow and you take on new roles and, and, and more responsibility, you begin to truly develop you know, who you are and uh, where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are, and more importantly, and then you, then you start to, uh, through experience, develop um, a sense for how meaningful it is to surround yourself with people that can provide insight and feedback and guidance for you in areas that you may not be as strong. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I wouldn't say it was intentional, but it has definitely been learned, and I still use it today. Are there uh, any books that you've read uh, either recently or in the past that you would uh, recommend to somebody as they're uh, in a, a leadership position? Yeah, it's a, you know, books are, books are kind of, uh, you know, they're, maybe they're undervalued today, uh, you know, especially in an area, an era of, uh, you know, binge watching, uh, you know, Netflix and whatnot. Yeah. But yes, I, I think that, and I'm not, I, I wouldn't say that, you know, every opportunity I have, I'm looking for the next self-help book. But I do think that there are reads from the past that I felt um, maybe feel more tied to as far as, you know, what I've been able to accomplish over the course of almost 30 years. Um, maybe very early in my career, because I was a salesperson, one book that sticks out to me is, uh, is uh, uh, 25, what was it? 25 Habits of Highly Successful Salespeople. I think it was... Uh, okay. I think it was Steve Schiffman or the author, I can't recall, but you know, there's a book that, you know, when you don't know anything, at least gave you a, a playbook from which you could try to operate from as a salesperson. Uh, you know, it, it, my, my reads evolved as I took on more responsibility and became a leader, especially in my younger years as a leader. That was difficult. You know, when, you, when you're given an opportunity to lead large parts of the organization that have significant contribution to the overall company and you're young, um, it, 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 it's a tough place to be. Uh, I think books that helped me during my transitions over time, one that I still recommend to a lot of people, and I don't think it's just leadership, this book, I've always loved it, is, is uh, My First 90 Days, Michael Watkins. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a book I think that anybody, no matter what you do, med tech, non-med tech, sales, leadership, uh, you know, civil service, it doesn't matter because it's a book about uh, focusing on building brand, how important it is, no matter what you do, whether it's a promotion or a new job, uh, how important it is to to spend that first 90 days and, and not trying to contribute, so to speak, but mm-hmm. understand maybe the small areas where you can add value, but spend more of your time listening and learning and developing who you're going to be, you know, a year out, two years out, three years out. Because I think it is difficult for people when they come into an organization or into a new job or being promoted, that if they don't focus on that, it's very hard to undo later on. Mm-hmm. When you lose the ability to, to, to create credibility and trust, um, it, it is this magical point in time, I guess, at 90 days or after, that it becomes difficult to unwind. That's been very helpful for me. The, the one book that I, I think still I still pick up, um, uh, and again, this was learned, was my one of my old CEOs, Bill George, wrote a book, Authentic Leadership. Mm-hmm. And for me, um, that has been valuable because I, it, I think that understanding who you are as a person becomes more important as a leader than understanding what you think you should be as a leader. Um, you know, you, you can't fool people. People are too smart. So, you know, trying, you know, in my early parts of my career, I think, you, you know, you, you think that you have to be somebody that you're not, and therefore you become exposed on your flanks. Uh, the blind spots, as they call them. And I think that the more you can stay true to yourself, which is, you know, the, you know, how to build, you know, uh, your, your, your own, you, you know, you, to s- the strength of your self-awareness and, you know, how you create vision and how you leverage, you know, personal integrity to build your organization. And uh, these are things that become more important for me rather than, you know, some academic uh, formula to be good, be a good leader. Um, and I guess some, um, the last book, and I, you know, this may be, this may be one we, we don't, but, but I, it, I thought it was an amazing book. It starts out actually not as it seems in the end, but uh, it's called, um, it's called the art of not, uh, the subtle art of not giving a bleep. And uh, that <laughs> word begins with an F. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, Mark Manson, I think. And, um, and this book was pretty incredible because it really, it really does, it starts out, you think that this is going to be this crude book. And at the end of the day, through, the, through, through his experience, personal experience, it drives us as a person to understand what are the things that we think about every day that add no value, that consume us, mm. you know, our appearance or whatever. Um, you know, are we fit? Have we lost five pounds? Are we gained? It, it, it really, it really, <laughs> it really kind of keeps you focused on the things that are most important that truly matter. Um, so that you can free your brain, so to speak, mm. to do things that, uh, you know, from the things that don't matter so that, so that you, can, you can deliver. But those are just some examples of things that jump to my mind anyways. You know, spread in there is a bunch of other things, but I tried to hit the ones that I think have been most meaningful. Great. So outside of work, uh, what is it that you do that uh, helps recharge you? I, I spend, um, you know, a lot of time with my family. Uh, my wife and my three kids that are now, you know, growing uh, all in school, uh, all live away from home. Uh, uh, you, you know, the, the, every chance we get to be with them as a as a group, as a as a unit, as a family, we we take. And so, you know, outside of work, uh, we do travel. Um, you know, my wife and I, now that we're, you know, what they call, I guess, now at this, these days, empty nesters, uh, we spend time. We go on the road. We go see our kids. Uh, when our kids are available in their home, we take, we go on vacation. Um, you know, I do have hobbies. I play golf. I'm not very good, but you know, if I get a chance to go spend time with friends, I'll get on the golf course. Uh, I think later in life now I've become more interested in, uh, in, uh, you know, things that aren't as stressful like boating, you know, <laughs> <than golf. laughs> right. uh, you know, it, it te- there's something magical about the water. And uh, spending time with your friends and loved ones or whatever, uh, I've done that. But yeah, I, I think it's uh, I think it's just all been about family outside of work for me. Mm. So, any parting advice that you'd give uh, again an up and coming leader or a new leader uh, that uh, that you think would be be good advice for them? Yeah, um, I, I think be the one thing I, I guess would be be excited about what you do. Uh, you know, and if you're not excited about what you do in your early part of your career, the beauty of that is because you haven't 
amass this massive amount of responsibility, change. Hmm. You know, it's, it's okay to, to try things against, do your best to surround yourself with the right people, the right companies, the culture you think you'll thrive in those, those cultures and those companies that value development and mentorship and the things that you, that you had mentioned earlier so that you can grow as, as both a person as well as a professional. Um, uh, but be excited about what you do because the day that you're not excited about what you do is the day that it won't matter how much money you make. And, uh, you know, that, that may be some parting advice. Surround yourself with the right people. It's, uh, it's, it, there's just nothing to replace that. If you're in the wrong situation, you have to change it. Um, trust the support of your family and friends. Uh, it can't be undervalued. You can't do this alone, especially as you, you move on in your career and you start to travel and the world gets crazy. You have to have a strong support network. Um, yeah, but in, at the end of the day, it, it, it then just is trust, trust in your own potential and uh, do what's going to make you happy. Great. Well, thanks, Brian. Appreciate you being on the podcast. and wish you continued success in your career. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. It was enjoyable. Thank you for listening to the Motivated to Lead podcast. Please subscribe on iTunes. You can also see a video version of this interview at motivatedtolead.com. This podcast is brought to you by SEMA Partners, helping you find your next great leader.